embark on a journey of inspiration and discovery with the Purdue Lecture Hall Series, proudly presented by the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Disease. Join us as we delve into the remarkable odysseys of these aspiring scientists, each crafting their own narrative in the world of science and groundbreaking research. Take a glimpse into their diverse cultural backgrounds and the journeys that brought them to Purdue University. Thank you for watching the Purdue Lecture Hall series. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Welcome everybody. My name is Tommy Soares. I'm the Director of Scientific Strategy and Relations for the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology and Infectious Disease. And today on our Purdue Lecture Hall series, I have the pleasure of welcoming Arnav Deshpande, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the National Renewable Energy Lab, NREL for short, in Gold, Golden, Colorado. He graduated with a PhD in chemical engineering at Purdue University, working under Dr. John Morgan on sustainable production of aromatic amino acids in cyanobacteria in May of 2022. He is currently working on several projects at NREL on carbon capture and utilization and algal metabolism using machine learning and multi-omics approaches. He received the Director's Award and a Key Contributor Award at NREL for 2023 and hopes to continue working on important research problems to address climate change. Welcome, welcome, Arnav. Thank you so much for being on the show today and talking to us, telling us all about your journey. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. And I'm really happy to uh, be invited to this uh, Purdue Lecture Hall series and be associated with my uh, PhD university and really happy to share uh, my research at Purdue and then my journey and my transition to a postdoc uh, position at NREL. So I have made a small presentation yeah. that I'd like to share. Go ahead. What I'll do yeah. is I'll turn myself off, let you take the spotlight. I'm so excited that you'll be able to tell us a little bit about your transition too. It was one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you because you know, we typically have uh, students and postdocs that are at Purdue and presenting their work, but you had made a leap outside of Purdue and it's so fascinating to capture that journey too. So maybe if we have a little bit of time at the end, would love to uh, hear about that and ask you some questions. So as promised, I'll turn myself off. Please take it away, Arnav Deshpande. Thank you. Uh, my name is Arnav Deshpande, and I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher at the National Renewable Energy Lab in Golden, Colorado. And uh, currently, I work primarily in the field of uh, bioenergy and uh, specifically on analytical biochemistry and metabolomics techniques uh, to study uh, production of biofuels from uh, photosynthetic organisms. So I'd like to start with a brief uh, introduction to my journey. So I was born in uh, Nagpur, India, which is a small city, uh, although it does have about 2.5 million people, but in terms of Indian cities, it is a smaller city. And I grew up there and uh, in my childhood, I also moved to Bangalore, which is kind of the Silicon Valley equivalent of India for four years, and then moved back to to Nagpur again, uh, where I completed my high school. And uh, after that, I moved to Goa to pursue my undergraduate degree in chemical engineering, uh, after which I uh, got my first real uh, opportunity to perform research at Unilever Research in Bangalore, which is what uh, motivated me to pursue research as a career and brought me to Purdue in uh, West Lafayette, Indiana. So I'm just gonna start a pointer. Uh, West Lafayette. And uh, in 2022, after graduating from Purdue University, I moved further west to uh, Colorado, Golden, Colorado, to work at the National Renewable Energy Lab. So uh, I was born uh, in Nagpur. So this is uh, kind of a 
newer image but when i uh lived in nagpur it didn't have any like tall apartment buildings it was a fairly small city and i grew up there uh and this is my school uh it was a smaller school near a modern school about 400 people attended it and uh it was a really good uh school in terms of getting the personal attention uh because of being such a small school and that really made me have a really good relationship with my teachers who promoted me uh who motivated me to pursue an academic uh, career and try to so as a kid i wanted to be like a teacher and as i moved throughout my uh career i subsequently uh engage in activities like uh motivating high school students and uh undergraduate students by mentoring uh, at Purdue and even at Enrel so i grew up there uh Nagpur was called the is called the orange city because there's a lot of farms with oranges and uh, as a kid we visited a lot of national parks because Nagpur is in the center of india and uh, has a lot of uh, national parks around it where we can see tigers and this is one of the photos i clicked back in 2012 of a tiger in a national park near my city and uh, after school i joined uh, pits pilani goa campus which is one of the leading universities in india and on the bottom right we have a image of our uh, main academic building and here uh, i did not necessarily have an objective of uh, say doing research as such so what my faculty and teachers and professors at uh, bits pilani taught me uh, or suggested me was to keep uh, keep my options open and one good way of doing that was to maintain good academic grades so that would leave options open to either go into industry or pursue research uh, or maybe if i had an idea it be involved in startups and so on so uh here uh, that was the main thing i focused on trying to get good grades and uh, maintain uh, a thorough understanding of the basics of chemical engineering and uh, in my uh sophomore year i started looking into research opportunities and finally in my junior year of uh, undergrad i finally got a research opportunity in the uh, lab of dr jagatha nambi krishnan and she worked on microfluidics so uh, that was my first uh, sort of uh, introduction to laboratory research uh, other than the lab research courses so there i worked on designing a microfluidic device which is shown on the bottom here and uh, the main application was to use it as a tool for cheaply detecting uh, heavy metal ion contaminants in water by uh, using microfluidic assay so there uh, i really wanted to explore more uh, of a research uh, background and uh what actual research entails in a say r&d company or uh a big national lab so what i did was completed my courses a little early and uh in my final year of undergrad for the spring and summer i joined unilever uh and in india it is the hindustan unilever limited and this is a big uh, fast moving consumer goods company and uh shown here are some of the indian products that they make so they range from a variety of things uh, such as uh, ice cream tea coffee uh, surfactants detergents shampoos and so on so it was uh, a really big facility in bangalore and uh, when i went in there i was kind of intimidated by how much everyone knew and coming in from a chemical engineering background uh i did know uh, i did believe that i had the basics to learn but i did not actually have any real knowledge uh, at that point and that sort of motivated me to sort of become uh, capable of doing what the people at uh, the unilever r&d center were doing so it really motivated me to pursue research and not 
sort of go into the other choices I had open, which was, say, the oil and gas uh, industry, where there were jobs in, say, working in an oil rig, which did not sound appealing. So uh, I moved into uh, trying to do industrial research first as, in, as part of these internships. And here is where uh, I started working on surfactants. So they have Surfexcel, which is a detergent uh, marketed in India. And uh, here I was mainly involved in uh, doing simulations and mesoscale simulations to predict viscosities of these surfactant formulations uh, that the uh, company wanted to test. And I had no, no understanding of how simulations worked and uh, any background. So my advisor really showed me uh, at uh, Unilever the approach to take when uh, you do not know very much about a problem. So doing a thorough literature review, understanding the basics, uh, basic concepts, and then sort of learning step by step. And uh, in this uh, part of the uh, in this part of my professional career, I was very motivated to apply to graduate school. So while doing this internship, I was also uh, applying to graduate schools, primarily to master's programs in chemical engineering, but I also applied to only two schools for grad uh, PhD work, and that was Purdue and uh, University of Illinois. So at that time, I didn't know very much about most of the universities in US, but it happens that I somehow applied to only these two schools and I got accepted to Purdue. And uh, that was a big achievement for me uh, in my pursuit for pursuing a research career. So uh, I joined Purdue in 2017 and uh, went to the, uh, and joined the group of uh, Dr. John Morgan who works on uh, metabolism in algae and plants uh, and also other systems. So I joined his group because uh, he initially offered me a project on uh, cancer metabolism and that seemed completely new to me but a challenge I wanted to uh, try test out or try and um, cancer is such a big uh, disease and such a big issue in the world that I wanted to do my small part in contributing to something that may help uh, understand cancer better. So I joined his group uh, in the in December 2017. So uh, after the first semester of doing uh, a lot of courses and a lot of uh, hard uh, work, essentially we were staying in the, uh, what we called the dungeon for like 12, 14 hours a day doing homework and really hard courses in chemical engineering. So. After that, uh, throughout my five years at Purdue, I worked on three main projects, which I'll be talking about briefly today. Uh, the first one is uh, sustainable production of aromatic amino acids in cyanobacteria. And the motivation for this project was sustainability. So currently we have these aromatic amino acids. So tryptophan, phenylalanine, and tyrosine uh, produced via fermentation. And the fermentation is by microbes such as E. coli. And they use a lot of glucose and they use it inefficiently. So they waste a lot of carbon, release a lot of CO2. And this glucose is uh, derived from crops. And these crops uh, are then competing with the land that could be used to grow crops for human food, which is another big problem with uh, growing population and rising food costs. So uh, the approach that we had was to engineer cyanobacteria, which can directly utilize carbon dioxide, sunlight freely available, and convert uh, atmospheric CO2 directly into these value-added biochemicals. So that was my first project. And the second project sort of uh, built on what we learned from the first project and was more into understanding how the production of these uh, value-added aromatic amino acids sort of affects photosynthesis. And then uh, the third project, uh, which really was the one that uh, gave me the skills to tran 
to transition into a national lab uh, was the metabolism in breast cancer cell lines uh, and using bioanalytical chemistry, te uh, bioana bioanalytical techniques and uh, metabolomics. So I'll talk about these three projects uh, briefly and then uh, talk about my transition to NREL and what I do here. So for the first project, uh, it was trying to produce these aromatic amino acids, so phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. And these are used widely. So phenylalanine is a precursor to the sweetener aspartame. Tryptophan has many derived products uh, which are used as uh, or promoted as uh, uh, health benefit products, like uh, products uh, that help you have a better sleep uh, and so on, and also animal feed. So these are all phenylalanine, tyrosine, tryptophan are limiting in the diets of uh, uh, the cattle and pigs. And uh, if we can produce these and supplement these, the uh, feed, uh, supplement these to the feed of these animals, they do tend to grow faster. So uh, these are the main applications for these products. But the main uh, challenge in producing these products uh, using photosynthetic organisms is the tight regulation in their biosynthesis. So we have uh, two precursors, one from glycolysis, the PEP uh, phosphoenol pyruvate, and then E4P, which is erythrose 4 phosphate from the Calvin cycle. And these two precursors uh, sort of form the first step of the shikimate pathway, which is used to uh, biosynthesize these aromatic amino acids. And this is tightly feedback uh, uh, regulated by the end products. So if you make uh, enough of these end products to sustain growth, you're not going, uh, you're going to stop the activity of this pathway and not produce any more that can be utilized for things uh, other than growth. So to do this, we had to deregulate some of these steps. So the first step, the DHP synthase, and then uh, the branch point, which was chorismate mutase, which uh, converted this uh, intermediate chorismate into uh, prefinate, which is the next uh, step in the biosynthesis of phenylalanine and tyrosine. And then on the other side, there was anthranolate synthase, which is the enzyme conver that converts chorismate to anthranolate. So to, uh, to address this, we uh, took an approach which uh, used random mutagenesis since not much was at that time known about some of these enzymes. So we took the wild type cyanobacteria 680, synecosystis SPPCC 6803 and uh, used chemical mutagenesis to get a mutant population and uh, selected it with analogs. And these analogs sort of work by, as, uh, as you might have guessed, uh, mimicking the end products and inhibiting the pathway. So only those mutants kind of survive that can overcome that regulation. So with this selection, we found a bunch of overproducing strains and we selected the three most promising ones for sequencing to identify what really had uh, changed in them with random mutagenesis uh, to identify how those bottlenecks were relieved. And uh, this kind of shows the strain that we uh, selected, which overproduced tryptophan compared to the wild type on the left. And what we found uh, was, interestingly, uh, mutations in the chorismate mutase enzyme uh, in all of these top three strains. And this enzyme is actually in the phenylalanine and uh, tyrosine biosynthetic pathway. So not the tryptophan pathway, which was particularly interesting. And the first time it was actually found. So uh, the, yeah, this was something that I was talking about. It's actually the enzyme not in the tryptophan biosynthesis pathway. So when we looked at that in uh, a little more detail, so there was no protein structure for that enzyme available, but we looked at something closest to what we had, uh, which was Bacillus subtilis, and we found that uh, the mutations that we had, if we mapped those onto that protein structure, they all fell in the substrate binding re uh, region. 
So we hypothesize that mutations in the substrate binding region sort of uh, change the competition at that branch point and sort of reduce flux to the phenylalanine and tyrosine, thereby redirecting it to tryptophan. So we tested that by enzyme kinetic studies and found that not only was the substrate in, in, uh, uh, the allosteric site affected and the flux redirected uh, to tryptophan, but it also, uh, so if we look at the enzyme assay that we had, so we had our wild type chorismate mutase and the chorismate mutase with the V52F mutation. And we fo uh, found not, not only a difference in the uh, KM, but also the Vmax. So the uh, mutant enzyme also had a lesser maximal rate, even if we overloaded it with substrate. So with that, we figured uh, that we had not really addressed the uh, somewhat known bottleneck with the random mutagenesis technique of anthranolate synthase, which is which lays in the tryptophan biosynthetic pathway. So chorismate to anthranolate to tryptophan. So to do that, uh, what we did do was uh, metabolic engineering or just uh, genetic engineering. So we expressed uh, the feedback resistant forms of this enzyme from E. coli in cyanobacteria in the background of the uh, strain that we had gotten from uh, random mutagenesis and then uh, figured uh, and then did uh, assays to test how much tryptophan we were making. And what we found was when we relieved uh, this bottleneck, which was not addressed by random mutagenesis, we uh, found a much higher tryptophan titer. And that's shown here in the combined approaches of random mutagenesis, as well as uh, uh, genetic engineering, metabolic engineering, as opposed to only random mutagenesis. And then we optimized our production conditions to eventually produce about 0.2 uh, grams per liter of tryptophan in 10 days, which uh, is the initial foundation work for more engineering to go into uh, this strain and subsequently found faster growing strains for making it a more uh, economically viable product in comparison to fermentation. So while I was doing my PhD, there were many more uh, really fast growing strains coming into uh, the picture. So E. coli has kind of a doubling time of 20 minutes, so it grows really quickly. But uh, these uh, cyanobacteria that, would be, that we were using needed maybe 8 to 12 hours to double, but recent reports were really promising of two-hour doubling times. So we shifted our focus to grow, uh, to utilize faster growing strains, and this time targeted phenylalanine. And uh, since these faster growing strains were only recently isolated, not much was known about uh, their biosynthetic pathways and enzymes and so on. So we, again, decided to go with a random mutagenesis approach. And uh, we used a similar uh, procedure where we used uh, chemical mutagens as well as UV radiation and selected mutants and then took the top candidates, uh, subjected them to another round of mutagenesis, much, with, uh, much like what is done in industries. And uh, with this uh, developed mutants, which were uh, a combination of uh, multiple rounds of random mutagenesis. And uh, we found really good results in the M14.2 strain, which produced uh, roughly 100 milligrams per liter per day under just ambient air conditions. So with this promising result, uh, we looked at it in a little more detail. So we grew that strain, which had multiple rounds of mutagenesis in a higher CO2 environment. And it accumulated 1.2 grams per liter in just three days of culture. And the most interesting aspect was by producing phenylalanine, it was not really sacrificing any biomass uh, uh, any carbon to biomass. It was an added benefit. So it was fixing more carbon. So with this interesting result, we actually filed a patent application with the Purdue Office of Technology Commercialization, which was another really new thing to me of actually 
thinking about research in a more uh, commercial or financial way. So they helped us a lot and uh, got us involved with the Purdue Accelerator competition. And this competition was essentially for emerging research at Purdue in the agricultural field. So uh, we did compete in that and went to the final round, which is the thing, uh, I don't exactly remember, but around 10 teams where we were competing for $100,000 to scale up what we were observing in a laboratory environment. And uh, I think we did really well uh, as just a team of two people, me and my professor, uh, John Morgan. And uh, uh, it was a great experience and uh, for me to understand all the other considerations that go into research if we look to commercialize it. And this is currently, uh, this patent is still uh, pending. And the main uh, uh, focus of that was, if you look at our organism in a space time yield, which is the amount of phenylalanine that we can make per hectare of land per day, it's much higher than E. coli and plants uh, to make the same amount of phenylalanine because uh, the although the E. coli makes a much higher titer much faster, it depends on uh, growing plants for its carbon substrate, whereas we can utilize CO2 directly from the environment. So uh, we had a higher space-time yield, but we weren't able to actually scale it up because we didn't win the competition. But it's really, uh, it was really a good experience for me to get involved in everything. And uh, that actually made me talk to a lot of startups and see what they do in terms of uh, what my career would look like if I did join a startup. Uh, so with this, we did go into looking at the competition between uh, production of those uh, phenylalanine without sacrificing biomass. So there had been some reports in literature that showed that when you make a product, which is uh, heterologous, or in our case, even a uh, native product like phenylalanine, you, when you overproduce it, you do not necessarily sacrifice biomass that you make. So it means that we made uh, that product phenylalanine by fixing more carbon. And that really interested uh, me a lot to see how that was happening. And we looked at that and I'll go over this briefly uh, through uh, this representation over here, which is the photosynthetic machinery and it's linked to the Calvin cycle and downstream biomass and phenylalanine production. So it shows how electrons flow and they can flow either in a linear path, which produces uh, about 1.38 ATP to uh, 180 NADPH and ATP is the energy, uh, NADPH is the reduction power. And in a cyclic flow, uh, as shown here, you only produce ATP. And if you look at the demands that we have, uh, the biomass has a certain demand for ATP and NADPH and phenylalanine, phenylalanine has a certain demand. And phenylalanine is a more uh, reduced product compared to biomass. So it's suspected that biomass needs roughly 1.7 uh, ATP to NADPH and phenylalanine needed only 1.5 ATP to NADPH. So it was more NADPH dependent. So we hypothesized that making this uh, added product sort of changed uh, the proportion of linear and cyclic electron flow and that uh, the imbalance initially between the linear and cyclic electron flow sort of uh, was not, uh, was limiting to carbon fixation. So we studied that with some photophysiology experiments and did show eventually uh, that suppression of the cyclic electron flow was uh, responsible uh, for the added carbon fixation and production of uh, phenylalanine. So with that, uh, I wanna move direction a little bit because uh, here uh, the other, this project is the cancer metabolism project which really brought me to NREL. And while I was doing all these other projects, my which were my main projects at Purdue, 
the other graduate student was studying algal metabol uh, algal and cyanobacterial metabolism uh, in our group, and he was using 13 C isotopes to study that. So uh, what I wanted to do was study cancer cells using the same approach and uh, breast cancer cell, uh, uh, we chose to study breast cancer cell metabolism. And uh, I looked into literature and uh, we had uh, a lot of studies which use similar techniques studying breast cancer metabolism uh, in uh, 2D uh, geometry. And there was so much research and as a new person into the field of cancer metabolism, it didn't seem that I could make a contribution by doing the same system. So I looked at what uh, was currently done and most of the flux studies because of ease were done in 2D systems, which were uh, not representative of how tumors look. They were uh, a monolayer growing rapidly. Uh, they had probably different levels of gene expression, different uh, maybe protein uh, abundance and so on. So it was unclear to me how much they represented what was truly happening at the uh, in the real world. So what we wanted to do was then do similar uh, studies by using isotopic labels to see what's different between cancer cells and regular cells in a 3D environment. So which was more representative of tumors. So we chose these two cell lines. This sort of uh, represents how different they look in 2D and 3D. So on the left, we have images of a 2D cell culture. And on the right, we have the same cells grown in a 3D uh, geometry. So these HME2 cell lines had an irregular geometry, whereas the HS578T cell lines had a mostly uh, spheroidal uh, 3D structures, which then aggregated at higher densities. So we wanted to study what's the difference between 2D and 3D. So to do this, we used uh, this approach, which is called metabolic flux analysis. So gruesome cells in 3D geometries in uh, these six well plates, and then uh, did some characterization of the biomass composition for these, and also did characterize the uptake and secretion of nutrients. So the media already has uh, glucose and several amino acids. So we characterize how quickly those are uptaken. And uh, for the labeling, what we did was added, instead of glucose, we added a mixture of uh, labeled and unlabeled glucose. So 80% uh, glucose labeled at the one position and 20% uniformly labeled glucose and tracked uh, and let it reach steady state. So each metabolite kind of got a distinct uh, label pattern associated with it. And with that, we can then uh, go back and build a model to see where the glucose that we uh, that is uptaken goes to. So we did that using, uh, we let the cells achieve a steady state, extracted them and analyzed them on the LCMS and took all of this data that we had. So the extracellular fluxes, biomass composition, growth rate and uh, labeling data for the 13 C isotopes that we had fed it of glucose instead of the uh, regular glucose and tracked it in different metabolic, uh, in different uh, metabolites. So with that, uh, this just shows the differences in growth. Uh, so this data shows how much different 2D and 3D cultures are. So it shows the differences in uptake of amino acids and glucose and lactate, uh, in, which is normalized to the cells. So we kind of uh, get rid of that difference in growth rate by normalizing it to the number of cells we find there's a significant difference. So it meant that the previous research that was performed may not have been completely representative of a 3D tumor geometry. So with that, we uh, utilized uh, the metabolic flux analysis approach and fit it to a set of reactions uh, that we know exist in uh, cancer cells. Uh, 
So to do that, we basically minimized the difference between uh, the experimentally observed labeling patterns of all these metabolites shown here in metabolism and uh, to what was predicted by the model in an iterative approach. But to summarize, what we found was uh, that the cancer cells sort of in a 3D geometry decoupled uh, the TCA cycle and uh, glycolysis. So all the glucose that was consumed did not necessarily end up into the uh, in a 3D geometry into the TCA cycle. So that was decoupled. We also saw increased flux to the pentose phosphate pathway, uh, which is responsible for production of NADPH. We saw increased amino acid catabolism. So all these amino acids in the media that we had supplemented uh, were catabolized to supply this TCA cycle, which did not get any carbon from glucose. So maybe this was a compensatory mechanism. We found increased glutamine uptake, uh, which is a major carbon source for carbon cells. And then uh, with this, we wanted to look into maybe specifically one, uh, one of the main mechanisms of decoupling. So what we found was, so if we looked at the labeling of uh, the HME cells in 3D and HS578 T cells in 3D compared uh, the labeling of 3PG, which is a compound uh, directly downstream of glucose. So our labeled compound that we feed should label 3PG and that in turn should label lactate. But we found a difference at steady state between the labeling of the unlabeled fraction, so M plus zero, of uh, 3PG and lactate, which is very interesting because if you have the precursor labeled to a certain extent, the next compound should also be labeled at steady state to the same extent. But what we found was it was not. So uh, lactate had a much higher plus zero label. So it meant that the carbon was coming in from some unlabeled source. So what we think was that the no label from from glutamine, which was uptaken at a higher rate, might be responsible for uh, providing a higher M plus zero unlabeled state to the lactate compared to the 3PG. This may be due to the high, higher malic enzyme flux uh, shown here, uh, which is derived from glutamine. So that was something new that we found at that time. And uh, with this uh, set of projects, uh, the main goal for my next step was to try to utilize all the skills I had learned at Purdue. So the biggest skill was learning to learn new projects at which I had no uh, former experience. So when I started with cyanobacteria and algae, I did not work in biochemical engineering before. So that was completely new. And I it took a lot of time, but I did get the hang of it uh, after a couple of years. And then I successfully tried, tried to go into a completely different field of uh, cancer metabolism. But uh, I was able to do that because of the skills and techniques I learned by doing the project with cyanobacteria. So uh, all the analytical techniques, uh, experimental rigor, uh, and metabolism, which is essentially system independent. So if you can uh, learn to do that, then you can apply it to any system. So that made me uh, really confident in the skills I had. And I started uh, looking at the next steps after my PhD, which was a lot of startups because I was motivated to learn more about how startups function uh, because of the accelerator competition, as well as I was looking at fields in metabolism. And a natural fit was NREL. So uh, NREL is the National Renewable Energy Lab and Folk, and a part of NREL, which is the Bioener Bioenergy Department or uh, Directorate, focuses on using algae to make uh, biofuels and value-added products and biomass for fermentation. So uh, it was essentially a continuation of my graduate work, and that was a really good fit uh, looking at what skills I had. So I applied to that position as well as several hundred positions, I would say on LinkedIn and 
uh, other companies. So I did interview with uh, many chem- traditional chemical engineering companies like Dow and uh, 3M and so on. I did interviews with a lot of startups. And uh, finally, I thought that uh, a national lab might be something that gives me the ideal balance between an academic environment and an industrial environment. So I chose NREL in the end uh, as my next step uh, after Purdue. And it was a very easy transition because uh, of the really great background and uh, skills that I had developed at Purdue and its fantastic uh, research environment. So it was a really easy transition. So we moved from West Lafayette to further west to Golden or Denver, Colorado, and adopted a mountain dog, uh, Bunsen burner, <laughs> because uh, we moved to the mountains. So with that, uh, this is the current uh, campus that I work at, the South Table Mountain campus of NREL. And uh, NREL's campus is pretty vast, and there's about 2,500 to 3,000 research and administrative personnel that work here. And it is uh, kind of, I would say, a really uh, a next level of research in terms of the facilities and uh, the environment. And uh, there's several uh, departments over here. So we have a lot of solar uh, research, perovskite research. We have uh, bioenergy. We have electric vehicles, sustainability. In terms of that, we have... uh, a large scale up of the techniques that are developed in some of these labs. So we have the biorefinery and we have uh, the field test laboratory building is where I work, where we have several uh, custom built photobioreactors where I have the chance to scale up uh, shake flasks, which was the scale I was working at at Purdue in algae and cyanobacteria to move to the next level where we uh, do it in mini ponds and bioreactors to figure out if we can translate our findings from shake flasks to a more relevant uh, industry level relevant condition. So here I do work on uh, metabolomics and machine learning because I guess that's the new field that the funding is going towards and a really good uh, way if you have a large amount of data to analyze things that might be uh, overlooked in a traditional approach. So here I utilize the same techniques that I built uh, developed at Purdue, so the metabolic flux analysis, but instead of the cancer cells, we're doing algae, and then uh, the metabolic flux analysis needed a lot of metabolomics data. So I used, uh, I collected that data on algae instead of uh, cancer cells and did that on uh, several algae under a variety of conditions and uh, utilized all that data and put it into machine learning algorithms to figure out uh, strategies to improve biofuel productions. Uh, Not going into much detail about this since this is already, uh, this is uh, currently work in progress and uh, but the main thing that I learned at NREL was, uh, or leveraged at NREL was learning to learn. So I didn't have any uh, background here about machine learning and untargeted sort of metabolomics approaches. But from Purdue, I did know that if I have the basics done correctly, I can learn other uh, things if I give it the right amount of time. So here I was mainly initially learning uh, other techniques and expanding my knowledge to things that I had not done previously. And uh, now I'm much more comfortable in a, another new field. So uh, this really kind of helps me keep going is to learn new and new things with time and then be able to transition, say, maybe after the postdoc, I continue here or maybe I go to another field, which I can utilize all these techniques that I have of analytical chemistry and so on. So with that, uh, I would like to thank all my collaborators and 
uh, especially my advisor, Dr. John Morgan, who motivated me, uh, the Department of Chemical Engineering, Office of Technology Commercialization at Purdue, uh, and also uh, Dr. Soros for inviting me to this talk. Uh, yeah, and this, uh, I'd like to end it with this uh, image of the mountains where I work at the NRL campus. Love it. I love it, Arnav. This is what a what an amazing journey you've had. And I got to tell you, uh, so impressed by the way that you explained a lot of the metabolic engineering that you've been doing, because it's extremely complex. It takes a lot of doing and tweaking and you just uh gave us a real master class on on it uh it's it's great to see this advancement um you know you made a very important point that i continually stress in these types of podcasts that i do in that you're a life learner uh, you're a learner for life. Uh, and it shows that you have this tenacity to tackle these new concepts, these new subjects, these new fields, and just go for it. What, what would you recommend is the best way to start for somebody that is trying to get into a new area and want to gain some skill set in order to become a little bit more comfortable. I, I know it's case by case basis, and I know it's subject by subject basis, but what are the first things that you do in order to say, okay, I'm going to be really bad at this at the beginning, but eventually I'll get comfortable with it? Yeah, so I think the most important thing that I learned initially at Purdue was, uh, so I came from a chemical engineering background, didn't know much about uh, metabolism or algae or biological systems in general. So uh, I didn't know uh, a lot and that was intimidating at first. So uh, I the main thing that I utilized was uh, bouncing really stupid questions, uh, really basic questions that someone might laugh at uh, yeah. with my colleagues at Purdue. So uh, my group members at that time were really helpful. So there was uh, Shauna Gray, who's now at Cortiva, mm -hmm. who was studying plants. But I asked him, like he used to sit in my office, I used to ask him every day about really basic questions of uh, like metabolic engineering. And uh, my professor once said like, why don't you try to knock this gene out? And I didn't know, although I knew what I meant was to take it out of the uh, genome and uh, make it inactive for making a protein, but I had no idea how you do that. Yes. So uh, I went to uh, Rick and he, I told him like, how do I do this? How do I knock it out? And then he said, uh, yeah, you put in a sequence to disrupt it and so on and so forth. I didn't know, like, how do you put a sequence in? So it was like tackling one question and off, after another and seeking all the help uh, from everyone around. And the thing I learned was everyone's willing to help you in a research environment. And say, if they're not, then there's always someone else who's always willing to help you. There's so many people around at Purdue and here at NREL, it was kind of the same. I did not have a large experience in coding uh, in R or Python or anything, but uh, here I spent a couple of months trying to just write really simple programs uh, that not even related to what I wanted to do, but just to get familiar. And then the other thing I would say is keeping up with the uh, advancements in the field. So large, uh, so AI, all these chatbots and everything's coming up. So may, they're probably not reliable for you to uh, do a lit literature search and those kind of things. But what they're good at is writing bits of code, or if you have a problem with coding, you can ask it to write bits of code and test it. And 
once you do that enough number of times you already know what it's going to give give you so trying to i would say seek help from everyone who's more willing to help you than you would think and then the other is keeping up with uh, all the latest advancements and trying to learn it as fast as you can because at least in an academic environment all the funding is going to go to the newer hot hotter topics and then if you can leverage those in your research then you're more likely to be successful at learning a new thing right right no so well said i i really take that to heart too and I think it's it's a great lesson in it for all of us to listen to. It 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 comes with a lot of um dedication. How do you how do you find wait like it do you do it in the morning? Do you do it in the evening? Do you like if you needed to take an extra course in coding R or Python? uh there's a lot of great resources out there but what's the best habit to pick up in order to start getting into that field do you remember how you did it uh so for coding it was more or less i think uh, when i came to nrel it was i didn't exactly have time to do uh like learn like at a leisurely pace like say five hours a week you do that because i came here i was on two projects and suddenly people left and there's like five projects you're dealing with uh so then it became hard to sort of manage uh that so every day when i come in the morning is especially on mondays is i make a schedule for the week and uh do multitasks so for example if i'm listening on a meeting which is not really relevant to me but i have to be there uh on the side i can have something else going on and then i can still attend that meeting and get the key points so i learned to like find time in uh situations when there's not necessarily time say so you have uh uh the other thing was getting a lot of resources from the other postdoc here so again seeking others help so uh he gave me a lot of like chunks of code that i started modifying and then eventually figured out that i need to add to it and do uh modification so i think uh instead of starting from the scratch what i did was already took uh, half built uh Uh, i already took things that were partially in place and then uh modified them and uh initially i worked more on projects that did not need machine learning and all the coding so that gave me time to learn all those things while i was doing other things as my primary focus because if i would have focused on them first then yeah. i would not have made much progress uh, on them at that time but once i had those things going on in the background with other things as the main focus i could then uh, utilize all the things that i'd learned in say the first 8 months to then uh, apply to things that needed it yeah totally no i i i see i i i really like that approach and that you started with stuff that was already there and start tweaking to learn as you go Thank you so much Arnab. Um it, what a great lecture and what a great way to uh tell us uh, how this journey has gone and how you went from one place to another. Uh wishing you uh, all the best and continued success uh for your future in in everything that you that you do. So Arnav uh, Deshpande postdoc at the National Renewable Energy Lab Enrel in Golden, Colorado. Thank you so much for providing your lecture today. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, thank you. It was my pleasure too. Thank you. All the best. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you for watching the Purdue Lecture Hall series. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel.